a big part of our business is vehicle platforms. So a lot of what we do with our clients is actually we help them fast forward to make their vehicles by making these Lotus platforms available to them. So what you see out there, we can actually offer the architectures that underpin it to create very different cars to our clients so they can get there much quicker, time to market and much cheaper. Whoa, hang on a minute. Lotus is offering its car platforms to the wider market? Well, yes, and it's part of the British brand's big ambitions for global domination. Because while this legendary mark is famed for its Elise, Elan and other fantastic sports cars of yesteryear, 2022 is the year that it bids for the big stage. So, how's it going to do it? Long before we got to interview some of the big wigs of the Lotus team, including commercial director of Lotus Engineering, Mark Stringer, we knew that a multi-billion pound investment from Lotus parent company Geely was probably going to shake things up a bit. The firm's Hethel headquarters has been upgraded and it's gained access to technology scattered across the globe as part of Geely's portfolio. And now, with a new product lineup, it's got some serious assets to offer to the wider market. Just ask Radford, the British sports car maker co-funded by someone called Jensen Button. But then actually those guys are doing the engineering to really transform it into, the, into that Radford product, which is, which is great for them. The difference with, with those guys is that they're, they're choosing to, to put a Lotus brand on it. Most of our clients, you know, we, we work in the background in the shadows and then they go, they go forward with, with a brand that it's their own brand. So, so it's a kind of different relationship with them, but, but really exciting. Of course, Lotus fans will know that this isn't the first time the brands worked with other companies. Legends of the past include the Lotus Carlton, a supercar slayer of the 90s, and they even worked on the Proton Satria GTI, which, well, while not remaining so famous to this day, was actually a great handling hot hatch. It's all the stuff you can't see. Yes, it's the chassis, because we're very famous for our chassis, you know, very desirable. It's also things like the electrical architecture, which gives you all the infotainment and the HMI, but everything that keeps the car on the road. That's hugely expensive to invest in and even to tailor to a vehicle. So if you take something that's got the chassis system, the propulsion system, the electrical system, it all works together, it's all been tested, it's all been homologated, and then you can take that and just create your own brand around it. You know, the, all the A surface is new, everything the customer interfaces with and looks at can be entirely your brand and nothing to do with those at all. And we find our, our clients are able to really diversify, really move away from, from what that core architecture was for Lotus in the first place. So that means more products on the road could be engineered by Lotus. And that's not necessarily restricted to special edition sports cars. Want proof? Just look at how much Lotus's own portfolio has grown in these past few months. We can help people with everything from a, a hypercar, like the, uh, the Avaya we see over there, all the way through the range to the Electra on the stand. A big part of our business is around the next generation BEV sports cars. Lots of people are seeing that as a massive growth area in a few years' time, and they're trying to pitch their entry to the market correctly, and we can really help with that. But beyond vehicle platform, we also look at control systems, and we're doing a lot of work on engine controllers, for instance. So I think a couple of the cars here today, the hypercars have got our engine controllers in them. And although the cars business has said we're all BEV going forward, actually as an engineering business we love uh, our ECUs and, and we find the hypercar guys who need that really high performing engine at the right price for a niche market and finding where the people's come to, to deliver that. Yep, of course Lotus hasn't completely shifted to fully electric yet and no clearer is that than in the Amira sports car, which is available as a four cylinder with a DCT auto box and as a V6 with the DCT or a manual gearbox. Sure, the Avia hypercar is the brand's powerful electric statement, and the new Electra SUV could be a big electric seller, but the Amira is the brand's bread and butter. Well, for now at least. The design process is very enjoyable, a lot of pressures. We lock ourselves away for months on end, don't see our families designing things. But what, what counts at the end is people buying it, because we're not doing this for a sort of arts council activity, it's, it's a commercial operation. Naturally, the other cars will feel genuinely Lotus too, as explained by Ben Payne, Managing Director of Lotus's Tech Creative Centre. We've really tried to take uh, the core kind of design and aerodynamic philosophy that's really pioneered by the Via Hypercar over there, translated into the Amira and apply it to that product. So compared to other E-segment SUVs, there's an awful lot of aerodynamic narrative technology in the car that allows us to make something super engaging to drive. It gives you uh, great performance in terms of actually giving you downforce. Most SUVs in that category are actually neutral at best, if not generating lift. We've actually got some, some downforce numbers around that car that which will push the car onto the road and make it really dynamically very, very capable for a vehicle in that car. So the porosity aspect, how we channel air through the car, gives the visual drama, which really helps translate the design language and the drama that you have in, in sports cars and hypercars yeah. and apply it to a car in that category. So I think all of those things and, and that kind of translation of that, that design thinking 
it's quite evident. If you come up close to the car and look around it, you'll see that it's very different. For die-hard Lotus fans though, will there still be that rawness that models like the Exige have always been famous for? Or will technology come at a cost of purity? Russell doesn't think it has to. Well, we've sold more cars in a year than we probably did in the previous five, six years. As a brand, we're obviously trying to reach out to a wider audience because that's, you know, commercially what we have to do. And that's why we've got other cars in the range like the Electra coming as well. Yeah. But certainly with the Amira, the importance was that reach to get to people who use their sports cars in different manners and that attracts people in from other brands as well. Not only does Lotus want to work with more automotive brands, but it's also successfully broadening its demographic with the latest product portfolio, expanding from a die-hard fan base to attract newcomers, some of whom might have never considered a sports car before. Naturally, with ambitions to grow demand and reach more people, more models are likely to be on the horizon. Although nobody at Lotus is prepared to give away just how much can be spun off the new product bases. Not yet, anyway. I can't say too much. Obviously, if I told you anything, they'd have to kill me. So uh, <laughs> let's not go down that route. But yeah, it's a great platform to do other things in the future. So with an expanding, eclectic lineup of new cars and a growing potential to work with new clients the world over, Lotus looks well-placed to put many more great handling cars on public roads. And that, I'm sure we can all agree, is a very good thing. Although I can't lie, what's got me most excited is the prospect of more fantastic Lotus models to put up against a stopwatch at Rockingham. On that note, did someone mention an Amira GT4? Yep, best get subscribing to our channel to see when we can get our hands on one of those. See you soon.